was really technically excellent from the applications point of view or the uh, modeling point of view or both. Um, it was a real <coughs> pleasure to attend and uh, it, most of the people I didn't even know. So it, <laughs> it shows how big the GP community uh, can be. Um, Nicolau worked here uh, in Sheffield for a couple of years uh, with us and he's, um, it's a real pleasure to have him back because in some sense he's a founding father. He first, he organized the first Gaussian process at summer school. Uh, which launched the whole program. So uh, you can uh, blame him for the difficult questions about whether you're above <laughs> or below a certain probability on the first lap. Um, <laughs> and he's also got a lot of expertise across two different domains. So the kernel domain, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. He did his PhD uh, co-supervised by David Gonsberger, who's here uh, and is working in Switzerland now, but he's going to be talking later in the conference as well. So he's the ideal person to sort of talk a little bit about kernel design, and I expect he may not, but I expect he'll relate a little bit some of the ideas we talked about today to some reproducing kernel Hilbert space ideas as well. He may not. I said he's going to talk about lots of things. Maybe yeah, yeah, you, you gave me a lot of work uh, this morning. <laughs> he's going to mop up the day, and now you'll understand everything. So you, <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil. So I will be talking about uh, kernel design for, for this talk. And this is basically the outline of the talk. So first we'll talk about what's a kernel. So your question from this morning about is something positive definite or semi-positive definite? If you have questions about that, uh, I can, I will try to address that during this um, question in this section. And then a link on how to create new kernels, how to modify kernels. And um, then we'll see some interesting things about uh, what's happened when you apply a linear operator to a Gaussian process. Uh, so uh, I will first recall some uh, definitions. And even before talking about a Gaussian process, what is basically a random process? Because the way Neil introduced that, this notion this morning was from a vector and saying from this vector, you can have something continuous that will go through the point. But basically, one thing uh, one needs to have in mind when he's talking about a random process, it's just like a huge dice. And when you roll the dice on every tiny, um, uh, on each uh, vertex on, of the dice, there is a plot of a function. So each time you roll the dice, you end up with a function that can be considered as the output of a random uh, process, which is throwing the dice. So basically, a random process is something that will return r functions randomly. And we say that a random process is Gaussian if, if you take a set of inputs, then you will obtain a multivariate Gaussian. So basically, we have here x, the input space. And each time you roll the dice, you obtain a function. Now, a Gaussian process, if you take some points in the input space, how many, as much point as you want, but here x1, xn, if you cut the evaluation of one sample at all these points, this gives you a vector, a point in the n dimensional space. And we want a process will be Gaussian if this random vector is multivariate normal. And what is it to be multivariate normal? It means that whatever linear combination you make of your vectors, you can take any vector a, you multiply your random vector by this, so you obtain a scalar. This scalar is random because you multiply a constant vector by a random vector. And so the new value you obtain is Gaussian. <coughs> okay, so any linear combination of a multivariate Gaussian will be a scalar that is Gaussian distributed. So this is basically how you go from random process to uh, a Gaussian process, Gaussian vector. So yeah, this was just to recall some definitions. Uh, so here's some examples of the samples of a Gaussian process. I think you, you've seen similar things during, during the lab. So what Neil explained this morning is that the distribution of a Gaussian process is characterized by two things, a mean function and a covariance function, that is a function of two inputs that returns the covariance between the evaluation of the process at these two points. So in the talk, I'm going to focus on this object, the covariance function, or 
the kernel. So, um, so what about Gaussian process regression? So we assume we have observed a function f for a few points. So we have some observation points, and we want from that to draw a model. So we can make the assumption that the function we want to look at corresponds to one sample path of a Gaussian process. So now, what can we do if we want to combine the data we have and this assumption, this prior we have on the function? So one thing we could do is to remove all the function that do not go through the observation points, and we end up with this, which is basically the conditional distribution of our Gaussian process, knowing that it interpolates the data points. So uh, this is basically Gaussian process regression. So we look at a conditional Gaussian process, and this is what we what we obtain. So um, if we write the algebra, it looks like that. So the mean of the model is defined as the expectation of the pr process knowing that it interpolates. And we have these matrix multiplications to, um, give, us, to give us the expression of the mean. And we have something similar, a matrix multiplication for the expression of the conditional covariance of the Gaussian process. And so we can plot that as a mean and uh, confidence intervals. Uh, OK, so if we look at these two expressions, we are assuming something here on a Gaussian process. We're assuming that our evaluations come from the, or the function we want to study is a sample path from a Gaussian process. But if we look at, on the right, the two expressions, they only depend on the kernel k. So this is the key object that appears when you start looking at the conditional distribution. It really depends on the covariance function of the process. So what is a kernel? So if we take that any random process, so we don't assume here that it's Gaussian, it's just a random process, and we'll see what we can say about, about k. So um, here's some property we can derive directly from the definition. So if we evaluate the kernel in uh, the same point twice, so this is the covariance between z of x and z of x, so this is a variance, so this has to be positive or non-negative. And um, similarly, a covariance is symmetric, so this implies that the kernel is also a symmetric function. So this is immediate result, but we can obtain a result that is a bit thinner and so if we introduce a random variable t that is a linear combination of some evaluation of the process, if we compute the variance of t, we obtain this expression. So in a matrix fashion, it would be t is equal to a transpose z of x. So I, I evaluate z at all the points of x, and I multiply that by a vector t, and so the variance of t will be equal to uh, a transpose times the covariance matrix of z evaluated at x times a. So this will be a scalar. We have a vector, a matrix, and a vector here. This is a variance. So it means that this quantity can be negative. And here we, we recover that a, a kernel necessarily is positive semi-definite. Why semi-definite? Because here we can't say that a variance has to be, a variance can be nil, actually. For it's a de degenerate case, but a variance can be equal to 0. So this is why you obtain this quantity, so, so that any kernel without any Gaussian assumption is something that is positive semi-definite. Any question on, on that? OK. So if, furthermore, we assume that k is a stationary function, so I don't know if you've noticed, but most of the covariance that you've seen this morning, so for example, the RBF 
covariance is a function that depends only on the difference between x and y. So all the covariance where that can be written as a function of the difference, so x and y does not appear only through their difference, are called stationary covariance functions. Uh, most of the common covariance functions are stationary covariance functions. And we can have some further property for, for these. So for example, if the kernel is differentiable n times in zero, then you can differentiate it everywhere n times. So this, for example, showed that this quantity cannot be uh, um, a positive definite function. This one either. So this one is um, differentiable here, but not differentiable there. So it can be uh, positive semi-definite. And this one is the same. It's continuous here, but it's discontinuous here. So this can be a positive semi-definite functions. So there was a question this morning about uh, can a kernel be discontinuous? Yes, but if it is stationary, it can only be discontinuous in zeros. And uh, another one about the maximum values of a stationary kernel. The maximum value of a kernel has to be in zero. So this, for example, will never be a kernel. Uh, so we've seen and we've proved that if k is a covariance, then k is a positive semi-definite function. But the opposite is also true. You can use any positive semi-definite function as uh, the covariance of a Gaussian process. So there is an equivalence between these two concepts. You can use one in place of the other. Yeah. Can I just ask, um, just if you could go to the previous slide, um, to make sure I didn't skip it. You were saying that if we have <coughs> discontinuous covariance, a discontinuous kernel, then it can be only um, in zero. But that's for the stationary kernel? Yes. So, so for non-stationary kernel? For non-stationary kernel, or as, uh, for example, the example of this morning, it was a kernel that had a, a discontinuity, for example, in zero. It's a process that has a discontinuity in zero. So if you look at the kernel, it will be something similar. It will have this discontinuity in zeros. But it is not a process that is stationary, because it cannot be written as something of the difference. So for the non-stationary, there could be more discontinuity? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we have this equivalence that any positive semi-definite function can be seen as the covariance of a GP and the other way around. So when we hear about um, positive semi-definite functions, we know something else that is positive semi-definite. It's inner products. So the thing is, a kernel that is positive semi-definite also defines an inner product. And this is the functional analysis point of view. I'm not going to detail that much, but just two slides to say that there are very strong connections with other fields. GPs have very strong connection with other fields through this object, that is the, the kernel. So what is the RKHS? So it's a terrible word, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. But the thing is a very nice object. The name is terrible, but the concept is, is very simple. It's just the space that is generated by the kernel evaluated at one point. And yeah, it's the span of generated by this. So you can take your kernel function. You choose some points, uh, as many points as you want. Then you can have your kernel functions center on these points. This does not have to be a regular grid. It's whatever you want. And then you make a linear combination of these functions. And that will give you something like that, for example. So this function here, we call it h, is a function that lives into the space called the RKHS. And we have an inner product associated to this space, which is defined like that. So if h is equal to, say, alpha transpose uh, k of 
x h2 equal to h2. x then the inner product between h1 and h2 will be equal to a transpose x2 a2 so with this kernel we'll have a matrix here that will help us to that will allow us to compute the inner product so you can see this is very similar to the euclidean inner product that would be something like that except that we have a matrix in the middle and since k is a positive semi-definite functions this ensures that the inner product defined this way is of course symmetric and uh, will be bilinear and will be uh, positive definite okay so from the kernel we've defined another space of function which is called the rkhs and if you look at the best predictor in the rkhs it is defined as the function that will interpolate the data points that has a minimal norm. So to link that with Andres Stoke, he was talking about diminishing the complexity. And here, having a low complexity is having a function with a low norm. So we'll try to find the function in the space that interpolates the point and with the lowest norm. And if you do the math, then you end up with this quantity. And it means that we obtain the exact same expression as the mean of the conditional Gaussian process knowing the, knowing the observation. So basically, from one kernel, you can define either one Gaussian process or one RKHS. But whatever framework you choose, when you look at the best predictor, you end up with the same objects. OK, so this is a way to explain that it's interesting to look at a process and its uh, and the associated model, but for a process, you also have a kernel, and maybe this object is more fundamental than the process. So, if we want to build a model, we've seen the expression only depends on k, so we can take any kernel, you can pick your favorite kernel in the list, and, uh, and make a model. Uh, so, um, I'm writing here that most of the kernels are stationary. What are the kernels in there that are not stationary? Uh, there's one here. This one cannot be expressed as a function of the difference. The two above uh, can. And this one too, the Brownian motion, is not a stationary process. But all the other ones are stationary GPs. Any question on these covariances? Yes? Which one? The delta, the white noise. Yes, white noise is a Gaussian process. Part of the RKHS, and that's why it's really uh, no, no, you can associate an RKHS to, to the white noise. Oh, okay. It will just be, you can start from this definition, it will just be a function with spikes in some points, and this will be the RKHS associated to, to this kernel. So here's the plot. Uh, so here it's kind of obvious to see that uh, the, um, the Brownian is not uh, stationary, uh, but the other ones, the Brownian linear and the splines are not stationary, but the other ones are. Uh, so if in the expression of a model we change the, we, we change the kernel, then we end up with two very, very different models. So this one is for an exponent exponentiated quadratic and the one on the right for an exponential kernel why are they so different and is there one model better than the other is there one model you prefer in in the two over there yeah that's uh, I had the right answer it really depends on the data when you change the kernel you have so much difference because it means changing the prior you have Oops. so this is the prior behind the choice of the kernels we are making here we have a function that is infinitely smooth and this one is continuous but not differentiable anywhere so you can't say just from this picture oh i prefer this model because the confidence interval are much uh, smaller well if the function you want to approximate is actually like that this model is rubbish and the one you really want is 
is this one, right? OK. So um, we've seen some of the usual kernel. We've seen the definition of uh, positive semi-definite functions. The, the question is, how can I prove that a function is positive semi-definite? So this is something that is very difficult to, to prove if you start from the definition. Because if we come back to the definition, uh, yes, if we come back to the definition, it's this slide. We want to prove that this quantity is positive, whatever the set of points x we choose, and whatever the value of the vector a is. So uh, we, we can't use these to prove directly that a function is positive definite. So there is one interesting result from uh, Bochner that is just about stationary covariance function. But this is very helpful to prove that a stationary covariance function, that a stationary function is positive definite. So it says that a function is positive, a stationary function is positive definite if and only if you can write that as uh, the Fourier transform of a positive measure. So if we start from the usual, uh, yeah, so here is an example. So we take uh, this uh, measure here, which is positive. We take its Fourier transform. We obtain this a sync function. Uh, so this proves, this theorem proves that since this is positive, then this will be a uh, positive definite function. So you can use sync to build new models. You can plug that. Uh, yeah, I think it's already written in GPy, but yeah, you can use it because you can prove that it is positive definite using Bochner theorem. So if we take usual kernels, so for example, the Gaussian kernel, so the RBA for exponentiated quadratic is the Fourier transform of itself. So it is positive semi-definite. Matern kernels are Fourier transform of things that have this uh, shape. So they also are positive semi-definite. And if you look at uh, distribution, then uh, the um, Dirac delta is the Fourier transform of the constant function. So the covariance of white noise is positive semi-definite. And uh, the other way around, the constant function is the Fourier transform of a Dirac delta. So it's positive definite. All right? Uh, there's some interesting work from uh, Andrew Wilson, where he builds kernel starting from the spectrum of, of the kernel. So he takes a positive measure. And here, he takes a sum of Gaussian, and he symmetrizes this sum of Gaussian to make sure after taking the Fourier transform, it will end up with something that is real uh, without any Im imaginary parts. So he takes the sums of Gaussian. So this will be parameterized by the mean of the bells he's summing and their variance and also uh, a scale. So we have basically a few parameters in this space to describe that. And it's actually quite easy to take the Fourier transform of this. And this is what we obtain. On, on the right. So if we simulate sample path from this kernel, this is basically what we, what we obtain. Functions that are wavy, but not exactly periodic. But you can design covariance functions by their uh, spectrum. Uh, another popular thing to do is to, instead of uh, building a covariance function from scratch is to take existing covariance functions and to try to, to combine them in order to make new covariance functions. And so this is what we will see in this section. So um, it's rather easy to prove that if you sum two kernels together, then you will end up with a function that is still positive semi-definite. Or you can multiply kernels together and still the positive definiteness uh, is preserved. And you can combine a kernel, a kernel with, with a function. You can do all that, and you will still have functions that are positive semi-definite. So we'll see on a few examples how this can be useful. So this is a famous data set about the concentration in CO2 in the atmosphere. Unfortunately, it's rising quite a lot. 
So we'll try to predict for the next uh, 20 years what will be the CO2 concentration. Uh, so the first thing we can do is to say, oh, we are very often using this kernel. Let's try to see the predictions of our model. And we can see that the two predictions are, are terrible. So what happened on the left? On the, on the left, we say, oh, when I look at my signal, I can see some high frequency oscillations. One oscillation here corresponds to, uh, to one year. The period of an oscillation is one year. The CO2 concentration is higher during summer and lower during winter. So this is what we can see on the high frequency oscillations. So if we have these high frequency oscillations, we'll take a Gaussian process that is very, very wavy. And this is what we obtain for the model. So basically, the confidence intervals are OK. But the mean is very wrong, because we don't believe that in five years there will be no carbon, no CO2 left in, in the atmosphere. The opposite thing on the right, it says, OK, so I do have some, some high frequency oscillations, but there, there is also a trend in my model. So I will choose the parameter of my covariance to, be, to basically match the trend. And here we obtain a mean that is good, but the confidence intervals are very wrong because for the next years, we, we don't really believe that our signal will stay inside our confidence intervals. So if we take a regular kernel and we try to apply it, there's no solution for modeling properly this signal. On the other hand, if we say, OK, I have small scale variations and long scale variations in my model. So what I'm going to do is to sum two kernels, so basically the two kernels that I've been using here. And what happened here to our predictions, it's much, much better. One of the kernels stands for basically the trend, and another one with a smaller variance will take into account that we have small scales variation. So this model is much better than the two, we, the two models we had before, because both here the mean and the confidence intervals makes sense. But still, we can do better. If we look at here, we have the cycles of um, every year. And we could be interested in giving this information to, to the model. So the idea is, yeah. So the idea here is to have a kernel that will simulate periodic sample path. So basically, we give this degree of freedom to our model, saying, oh, there may be some periodic signal in it. And the first one is just to say, and there might be a, quadrat a quadratic trend in the signal too. And what happened now to, to our model when we have this covariance structure, we end up with something much, much neater that takes into account the periodicity we have in, in the signal. OK, so just by summing kernels, any kernels individually is not good for uh, approximating this signal. But if you sum them together, then you end up with a model that is that is good, right? So another way to sum kernels is not to sum kernels that are defined on the same space, but to sum kernels that are defined on different space. So here, for example, I take the function here x is a vector, and it's equal to the sum of the two kernels, so one in the first dimension and another one in the second dimension. So basically, it can be represented this way. You have a function of x1, y1, 1, y1, sorry, a function of x2, y2. And then you sum them together to make a function of two variables here. So from a Gaussian process point of view, the kernel we obtain is the kernel of a process that is a sum of the process in x1 and another process in, in x2. So if we simulate sample path from this kernel, we obtain samples that are um, additive functions, so up to a modification if there are some probabilities in the audience. Um, so yeah, we obtain sample path that can be seen as additive functions. So how can that be useful? So of course, if you want to approximate an additive function, it's very helpful because you're giving this information to your model that in your prior belief, you say, I know that it is additive. And you will end up with a model that takes that into account. Or if you want to build a model for high dimensional input spaces, it's, it's, also, it's also interesting. So we'll detail that a little bit. So that is our test function that is additive. 
uh, I have 20 observations to try to approximate this function. And this is the two, mod the two models we end up. This one taking um, an exp exponentiated quadratic kernel, and the one on the right on taking a sum of two exponentiated quadratic kernels. So you can see that the root mean square error is much, much smaller on this one. And actually, the prediction of our model is much closer to the function we were starting from. Yeah? How is this different than uh, ARD? Or is that just like a subset of that? So the kernels, the two-dimensional RD often have this expression. Well, you have one parameter here for each dimension. What we are doing here, so this can be seen, I will talk about it later, as the product of two kernels. What we are doing here is we have a sigma 1, so k, uh, sigma 1 plus another kernel. over theta 2. So instead of having a product between two kernels, I have a sum. So in my two models, the one here is R ARD, and this one is additive. But in a way, it still, it still have its own uh, length scale parameters. Yes? Yeah, so I, uh, I think basically I take the grid that we can see on this plot. And I compare uh, and I compute the root of the square errors on this test grid. So basically, you first train it and then that's just the root. Yes. Um, so it's, we can see that this mean here is an additive function, whereas here it's not, because on the right, we put as an assumption in the model that our function will be additive. Yes? Only looking at the data, how do you know what kernel should be used? Uh, so that's a very good question. The, if you want to choose a kernel, you have choosing kernel is choosing the prior. So you have to choose a kernel uh, accordingly to what you believe about your function. So typically, if you know the differentiability of your function, you will choose a kernel accordingly that gives you sample path with the same regularity. Um, and regarding the parameters of the kernel, because here I'm introducing parameters, uh, Neil will talk about that uh, tomorrow morning on how to estimate these parameters. So here, yeah, I assume that, uh, that I know that my function is continuous. I'm sh choosing uh, this kernel because they will give me continuous models, infinitely differentiable, actually. But yes? So you can answer that in the mean square sense, where you have a link between the differentiability of the kernel and the differentiability of the mean of your Gaussian process, which are basically uh, which will be the same. But if you look at the differentiability of the sample path, they will not be as smooth as as the kernel. Um, yeah. So so yeah. For example, if you take uh, an exponential covariance. The mean will, so your kernel is basically something like that, exponent, exponent minus the absolute value of t. If you look at the sample path from this kernel, it's the one I was showing previously that are continuous but not differentiable anywhere you obtain. something that is like that. So basically, uh, 
you lose orders of regularity when you go from the kernel to the sample path. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The different for stationary kernel, the differentiability of the sample path are expressed as a function of the differentiability in zeros. But uh, yeah. So for the exponential kernel, it's like that. For the matern kernel, you have higher orders of differentiability. Uh, so for example, for the matern 3 half, you can differentiate the sample path 1, but not twice. I'm not sure we should do the computation on the kernel to see if you can do that, if you can differentiate, if you can differentiate it twice or three times. Uh, that's something I'm not, I'm not sure about, but there is for sure a link that uh, can be found in the, in the textbook. Any other question? Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, yes, but if you do that, it really depends on the on the degrees of freedom on your likelihood functions. So you, you cannot, in general, compare that because if you add, uh, for example, if you c compare two kernels where one is more complex than the other, for example, if you uh, if you compare one kernel and this kernel plus another kernel, then the likelihood or the one plus the other one will be greater than the first likelihood when you optimize the parameter beca it's because it's kind of a more general form. So you can retrieve the other one, but you can also possibly do better. So it the likelihood of the optimized model will be better or equal to the other one. But and the complexity then grow in the determinant for your marginal likelihood? So wouldn't the added complexity basically get added to the determinant of your covariance matrix? So it would sort of grow in that. So it would sort of regularize itself, wouldn't it? Uh, I wouldn't say that. Because, because in practice, you, you can always improve your, your likelihood because you're giving new degrees of freedom. Okay. There is some regularization, but still you will always do something better. Yeah? OK. If you, sorry? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I, I won't answer that. You, you'll have to ask that to Neil. I'm going to use the same trick as he does. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, so um, if you write the expression of the mean <coughs> predictor, it has the, this is the usual expression, except that all kernel here is a sum of two kernels. And uh, yeah, so you can expand this product here into a sum of two things with the first one that depends on the first variable and the second one that depends on the second variable. So the model, your mean predictor will also be, be additive. And you can actually interpret that also as conditional distribution. It's the expectation of Z1 of X1, knowing that you've observed the sum of the two process. Uh, so if we look at the variance, we also have some interesting features. So this is if we use uh, an RBF uh, kernel. So you can see that when you go away from the observation points, the variance um, increases. But for, with additive covariance, there are some points here that have a low variance, even if there's no observations at this point. This is because if you know that your function is additive, and if you know it here, here, and here, this basically makes a rectangle. So if it is additive, knowing these three values, you know this one over there. So all the features of additive functions propagate to, to your model. So you can use this to, uh, in higher dimension. So if you want to learn a function that is additive, then you don't have to learn it everywhere on a grid. If you just learn it on, on marginals, then basically you know your functions everywhere on the grid. So yes, the variance shows some interesting properties by using this, these models. So what we've done for the sum of two kernels, we can do the same for the product of two kernels. So here, for example, we multiply kernels. We obtain a kernel. We multiply kernels on different spaces. We obtain still a kernel. So for example, here, if we multiply two RBF kernel, then we end up with this, which is still an RBF kernel. Um, so you can also compose a kernel with a function. So you define a kernel k of x, y as some kernel evaluating f of x and f of y. So this will also be positive definite. It's, this one can be proved directly from, from the definition. And uh, so here, the new kernels we define can be seen as the covariance of a process that is equal to the first process that has a kernel k1 evaluated in f of x. So this is a nonlinear rescaling of the input space. So this is basically what we obtain on, on an example where we use this function for the rescaling. So here we are rescaling the input space. You can also rescale the, um, the, y, the y space. Um, so this, for example, is a valid kernel. Can you, can you tell me why? What operations have I been doing? How can you prove that whatever f is, this will be a valid covariance function? Yeah. So the first bit is a linear kernel, x times y, that is composed with the function f. And then I'm making the product between this kernel and this other kernel. So this is positive definite, whatever f is. And uh, so if, as previously, I take the same function, then I end up with a kernel that is something like that, and that the sample path have this kind of behavior with an infinite variance in zeros. <coughs> So this is another rescaling, but of the y space and not of the x space. So now, what happens if we apply a linear operator to, to a Gaussian process? We'll see what, what it means. So um, if L is a linear operator that commutes with the covariance, so it's quite interesting to see what kind of operators will commute with the covariance. A good tool to look at that is the reproducing kernel Hilbert space framework. Uh, then this quantity will be a kernel. So basically, this is the, the covariance of, um, of a function where of the process that is L applied to the process. And since it commutes with the covariance, when you compute the covariance of L applied to the process, and 
you apply L twice to the covariance. Uh, so um, here's an example. So you want to approximate a function that is symmetric. So here's two examples of operator that will take any functions and return a symmetric functions. So this one basically duplicates the part that is on le the left as a symmetric on the, on the right. And this one, a rage, averages uh, the values uh, for symmetric inputs. So you can find a lot of details about that in, uh, in a paper from, from David, and I think he will talk about that in his, in his talk too. Um, so here's some examples of the sample path drawn from these uh, operators. So we can see that for the first operator, we do not respect the differentiability of the sample path we had from the beginning. So we are kind of losing some of the properties of the kernel by applying this operator. Whereas here, the sample path are still infinitely differentiable as they were in the beginning. So it's just a way to say, be, be careful about the operator you're, you're applying. But it's quite easy if you want to approximate a function that is symmetric to have a kernel that will take that into account. And so what we can see here is that from a function, have a projection of this function onto the space of symmetric functions is something quite easy. Here we have, for example, two operators doing that. But the question is, is there an optimal projection? What would be the orthogonal projection? And this is a question that has a lot of sense in the RKHS framework, where all the things where we have inner products and we can do everything with the inner product of the, of the RKHS. So it can be a difficult question. So for example, for the symmetry, uh, I don't know what is actually the best projection. This will depend on, on the kernel. But uh, yeah, it raises interesting questions. So, um, so I, I will show on an example that we can obtain uh, the optimal operator. So if we have information about the function we want to approximate, we know that it's a zero mean function. So if you integrate this function, we'll have exactly zero. So you want to tell that to, to your model. So the idea is to take a GP to find a projection to make it a function with that is th such that every sample is zero mean. So if you integrate every sample, you will obtain zero. And then once we have this operator, we can define this new, this new process. So, uh, so it can be shown that the optimal projection operator has this, uh, of this form. And you can compute the kernel associated to this process, which is like that. So if you draw sample path from this kernel, then you will obtain sample path. And if you integrate them, you will obtain exactly, exactly 0. So I'm a bit running out of time. So I'm not going to detail the sensitivity analysis part. But these kind of kernels are very interesting in uh, sensitivity analysis because then they allow you very easily to look inside the model and to see what is the effect of the first variable, what is the effect of the second variable, and so on, or what are the effect of the interactions between various variables. So they are very helpful for deriving these kind of, of graphics. But I will talk uh, a little bit about periodicity detection. So this is some work I've been doing when I was in, in the lab in Sheffield. So we have some observations, and we want to get the periodic part of, of this signal. So the thing we can do is to try to split the process into a sum of two processes, where the first one is periodic, and the second one is not periodic at all. So the thing we'll ask is we will ask uh, the periodic GP to be in the span of, of a Fourier basis. And what uh, you can prove is that the kernel of uh, the periodic GP has this expression where G is, uh, is a matrix that is called the gram matrix. So it's the matrix of the inner products between the functions of the basis in the RKHS. So this is the periodic part of the kernel. And we can define the aperiodic part of the kernel or of the function to, as something that is orthogonal to the periodic functions. And this is, this is what you obtain. So as previously, since our kernel is a sum, 
we can write the model as the sum of submodels. And we have also variance for the submodels. So this is basically what we obtain. So from one model, we split that into two submodels. Uh, can we improve that? So this kernel here has uh, two parameters, uh, a variance and a length scale. So once we've written this kernel as a sum, we can choose to tune the variance and the length scale independently for every subkernel. So we can have one length scale and one variance for the periodic part, and another one for the non-periodic part. And we can also add some um, another parameter for uh, that take into account the period of the periodic signal. And this is what you obtain after estimating the parameters. And here we actually retrieve exactly the function, which was a sine function plus a linear thing. So, um, so yeah, by tuning the kernel and choosing an appropriate kernel that has a periodic part, because we know there's some periodicity in our signal, and something else, we can retrieve very well our signals. We are kind of giving it the right degrees of freedom to approximate the, the functions. So yeah, I'd like to keep some time for answering the questions. So I'm not going to talk a lot about this, even if it's very interesting. I will just end up with this one. So um, what we are interested in this study is to detect among the entire genome, what are the genes with a periodic expression. So we have, yeah, so, yeah, so we, for this plant, it has 22,000 genes. We have 13 time points. So we make one observation of the gene activity every four hours. And then we look at what are the genes that are periodically expressed. And this is the one that can be found in the, in the literature. And this is the one that can be found using the, the method we are interested in. So we can see these are very strong spikes around uh, every 24 hours, whereas those, they do have a periodic component, but there's also a strong non-periodic component in, in these signals. So using the kernel in order to differentiate the periodic part to the, from the non-periodic part, then you can obtain this kind of of figures and some new periodically expressed genes. So as a conclusion, we've seen that kernels have a huge impact on, on the model. You have to choose the kernel accordingly to the prior belief you have on, on the function. And they can and should be tailored to the problem at hand. If you have informations that you can, if, if you have information such that the theoremine is symmetric or whatever, where you can project a function onto this space, then, uh, then you will be able to, to build a kernel that takes this information into account. And uh, yes, yeah, so Buckner theorem is very interesting for proving the positive definiteness of stationary functions. And it's also a an easy thing to do is to use existing kernel and to make transformations to, to them in order to, to obtain new kernels, for example, with, uh, with various length scales in it, so high and low frequency as on the CO2 data set. Or and yeah, the last thing about the linear operator, if you have a linear operator that projects the function into the space you're interested in, then you can apply that twice to a kernel and you obtain a kernel that encodes the information you want. Uh, here's a few references, and yeah, the slides will be on the on the website. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one we had from the Buckner theorem, right? One like that, for example. It is kind of periodic, but with an amplitude that decreases. Is that what you... Something like that? Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, these. Well, similar, yes, but you mean from the lab class or in the slides? The exercise we did before. Ah, okay, okay. The in the lab sessions, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's I can't remember because yeah I wrote the exercise two years ago <laughs> I wrote this exercise two years ago and uh, yeah I can't remember uh, RBF time cosine so yeah yeah that's so, so I think you had that, didn't you? Yeah. So it's a bit like um, the things that... Yeah, this one. Yeah, I think it's that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes? Do you use any, any more automated way of getting your kernels? Or is it always just educated guess? By more automated, I mean that, for example, you have a special algorithm that first we're checking the set of kernels and seeing how much we can explain and then see if we can add something to, um, to improve it? Or is it that no, so, so I, I don't have this kind of, uh, of algorithm in mind. I'm more using uh, expert knowledge. When uh, if someone asks me to make a model, I will ask him, OK, but tell me all you know about the thing you want me to, to approximate, and I will bu build the kernel accordingly. Yes. Yeah. And um, they 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 say that they, they basically make like um, an infinite family out of that. So they start, for example, with linear. They see what's the. I think they're actually using marginal. Um, like like you would. Marginal. Yeah. And they see if um, they exchange one of the kernels or add yeah. one of the kernels, and if this improves in a substantial way. Um, I didn't manage to actually run that because I think it's not in Jupyter. Okay. Uh, or maybe it works in some special cases. Mm. Um, but I was wondering if, if you actually ever thought about this as a sensible approach. Yeah, I think it's uh, definitely a sensible thing to, to do. When another option, when you're not sure, is you, is you basically sum all your kernels that you might think reasonable. And then you want your maximum likelihood to turn off some of the variance parameter. If it thinks there's nothing linear in your signal, then it will just put a zero variance associated to this kernel, to this part of the signal. So it's not a big deal to put too much in your kernel. And then you hope that the maximum likelihood will turn off the ones that are not necessary. But uh, yeah, it's, it's one way of uh, looking at the problem. It's kind of better to put too much than not enough. Yes? That was basically a comment on that question. So let's see if it was from the same river, I assume. Yeah. OK. Yes? I'm sorry? The, the whole thing of having so many kernels available to choose from. Yes. <coughs> Yes. So uh, I'm just, I mean, uh, the whole thing reminds me a bit of the Google's, you know, base where you had different uh, machine learning algorithms and you just model selection and people came up, up with all kinds of ideas how to properly do model selection. So um, this is in a way the whole thing all over again, right? Yeah. So, so I'm just wondering if there is kind of a, a good practice about how to go about it, especially if you don't really know your problems. Because then the only thing you can do is you can, you know, try it out and see on a 
told us that or something how male does it, and that's it, right? Yeah. So is, is there any other way essentially to, to go about this in, in the context of court process? Yeah, so I, I, it's a bit related to the previous question, like if I have a library of kernel, how can I choose yeah. in this library or which combination of kernel in this library would be would be interesting. So yeah, it's not something I've been looking at uh, a lot, but yeah, for me, my, from my point of view, it's more uh, if someone asks you to make a model, you have to uh, okay, tell me about the thing you want to approximate and what kind of assumptions you, you're ready to make. People do, so Maurizio Alvarez at the back has a paper where you use a IDP, infinite binary processes, to combine many, many kernels together. So that's a sampling approach, which is different from this CCD thing that we talked about. Uh, I think the problem is that as you start exploring these, these uh, different approaches, you find you get a computational burden. So as you go much larger in terms of data, but you see them, but then you don't care. You've got so much data, you'll determine these parameters well anyway. I mean, unless you, we, we go crazy with covariance functions in our research group, put a lot of parameters in them. But even if you combine 30 of these kernels, you have 30 parameters. So if you have 20,000 data points, fitting 30 parameters to those is not such a big deal. You can do some hybrid Monte Carlo sampling over them as well. That's implemented in GPy. So you've got a number of different options. It's not really a big headache. It's like sort of saying, it is the same sort of challenge as like when you try and buy a sandwich in the United States. You can't just buy a sandwich. They say, well, did you want this bread or that? You know, do you want Swiss cheese, eight different types of cheese, you know? And it's a bit stressful if you just want a damn sandwich. But it, <laughs> if you really care about the form of your sandwich because you're looking for a specific form of sandwich, then it's very powerful. <laughs> So there are some sort of standard sandwiches, like the RBF, the exponential quadratic, that work well in general. Um, but all these sort of families, sort of things like Nicolas got up here, like this particular periodicity, it's like, well, I, I, you know, I want a specific element for this. Um, I want a seeded bread, you know, that sort of thing. So it's just about options. You don't have to use them, the default covariance functions that people use quite widely. You don't do this sort of thing. You sort of should know what you're doing before you start trying to do this thing, but there are ways of fitting uh, parameters as well. It's just a bit more involved than the sort of things we'll cover in the, this course. Are, are you telling me that you're a sandwich uh, <laughs> for, that it doesn't actually matter that much? Um, it, for large data, it may not matter too much. Well, yeah. Nicola's example from uh, the William Rasmussen and Williams book is really good. Can you pull it up again, Nicola? Uh, it's a really good example of explaining. Look, it, which one do you want? RMSE in this region here. The short length scale variant that Nicola showed before will function just as well. It's RMSE in the region where you observe data is pretty much identical to this complex covariance function Nicola has here. What's going on here is Nicola has included the knowledge you need to extrapolate. It's in this region here where you'll struggle. So go, go back to the one where you had this. But the, the RMSE on this is great because there's enough data locally, right? So you don't gain much in this region here by adding eight different covariance functions in, right? You do gain over uh, this one, because I think this one is the one that's explaining this oscillation with noise. So this one has a worse RMSE than this one. But if you look at the RMSE within the region of the, where the training data is for the more complex covariance, you don't get a win. But what you're doing is you're including a bunch of stuff you know. You know that these effects are seasonal, you know that there's a long-term trend that's going on with some sort of, you know, our industrialization process from 1960. So you're sort of saying these effects should exist, and therefore you're including those functions to cater for those effects. So that gives you, that's when you really want the precise sandwich. This is the, uh, you know, I'll just take the ham and cheese on regular bread type of thing you can get here. Um, the one later is, oh, I need this bread and this bread and that. You know, you need something very complex because you know what's going on. So it gives you an enormous amount of opportunity to introduce prior knowledge to Say. I mean, normally the issue is that you have so many more dimensions that, that you are not actually that precise. Yes, no, that's true. In high dimensional cases, um, you, you will often not want to start doing a lot of stuff like this because actually, um, yeah. in high dimension, it's often much harder to say what's going on. So, in high dimensional cases, you'll typically see just the standard RBF is often used on its own, or maybe a couple, one for long range correlations and one for short. Um, and, and that's kind of the standard approach. 
the point of Nicolas talk is sort of showing that, that you know that's not it, that's not the end of your life. There's a bunch of stuff you can do. But normally you want to know a motivation why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, is there yeah. only is there an easier way to link how you think about building a generative model versus building a model out of kind of Because if you think about it, looking at this, you think, oh I use some model of seasonal trends and if you were making a generative model you put in the seasonal variation and try to aim for them to generate ABC and then try and put it down that way. I still want to know you have some tools to solve. And then try and think about how you to model this internal function is kind of indirect to your way of thinking about it. Yeah, I think that that probably relates to, um, I think that's the sort of direction the automatic statistician project goes in. So the automatic statistician project, uh, James Lloyd, David Duvano, Duvan Garamani at Cambridge. Uh, they're trying to build grammars over covariance functions. So the idea is that you have a function which has some data and you do some analysis and you try and learn this covariance function. You use a load of the compositions, I shouldn't call them compositions, the construction methods that Nicola talked about, multiplying covariance functions together, um, adding them together in order to describe, and they build a grammar over these things. And this grammar allows you to, once they've done that, to sort of describe in words <coughs> what they see in the data. And I think that that's a kind of nice project. You should check it out uh, online. It's a sort of way of, of it's, it answers part of this problem, what should I use? It's like automatically select my sandwich yeah, dependent on the data. Extracting the ratio from the person. Yeah. <laughs> so what you can do, like, so at a meta level, another thing that I think effectively that's doing is you're treating these things as non-parametric basis sets, right? So if you had a sort of set of basis functions that you wanted to include, I've just got a single bump here and then discontinuity and then a linear thing, those could just be bases that you linearly wait to come together. What this stuff is doing is effectively turning those bases into properties of functions, much, much more powerful. You can throw those bases in as well. But yeah, for you example, know, here. Just, yeah, you have some. Summing in. So this is not a single basis function. It's infinite basis functions at particular length scales, and then the same at shorter length scales, and then something that in, in imposes something periodic. So the funny thing is you can actually start doing things like Nicola said, you multiply either side by a function to make that effect local. This is what they do in the automatic statistician. You make that effect local defined to a particular region. Now, that's great and you can do that, but what you've effectively done is just now build a very complex basis function model. So you have the same sort of structural learning problems that you have with any kind of discrete basis function model. I mean, which is great, but it, it, you know, it, it has problems of its own. So the sort of thing that Maurizio did in his paper where you use an IBP process is you have a load of combination, you, you sort of use an IBP to compose those sets together for you. Yeah. No, no, you should really <laughs> use cross-validation. It's a very good idea. Use cross-validation, but don't use it for kernel parameter selection. Uh, for kernel selection. Um, I think that you use it, the approach in Bayesian framework, and in various different frameworks framework, is to do your entire model selection, perhaps according to the techniques I'll talk about tomorrow, and then cross-validate at the end um, to make sure things are stable. You could, you know, in, the cur in, the, in other areas like kernel methods, they would do cross-validation for kernel selection as well. But we, that, we try and have that as an inner loop kernel selection using type 2 maximum likelihood, and then the cross-validation to validate Typically, at the end, is something you should really do. Um, yeah. So, if I have no idea whatsoever about which kernel to use, I try the RDF. Does it something else? Like, is this a good No, no. Like, assume I have no idea about what. Uh, yeah, so I, I kind of prefer the Matson family of kernels yeah. rather than the RBF because they are not as regular. So you basically put less information in your model. If you have no clue, it's a rather strong statement to say, I think it's infinitely differentiable. If you have no clue, it's OK. Maybe it's more sensible to say, I can differentiate that uh, once or twice, but not much more. So Nicolas referring to say I'm a turn 5-2. Um, I think that, that that's a very good point. It's less important with high dimensional inputs. Yeah. Because with high dimensional inputs, you never what happens, the reason you shouldn't use this infinitely smooth thing is one dimensional inputs, if you start seeing data really close together, uh -huh. the um, differentiability of the function will somehow become identifiable. You basically realize that the thing isn't infinitely smooth, and then the 
of the RBF covariance becomes a very bad idea. In high dimensions, you, you don't really ever see data that close to itself to ever identify that. So um, that's why sort of the generic one you'll see in high dimensions is the RBF, because it's quicker to compute, I think, than the McFerrin yeah. 7.2. But Nikolai is absolutely right that probably you should prefer McFerrin 7.2 or McFerrin 5.2 as basic choices for, for time series, which is, you might wonder why he didn't use them here. <laughs> but interestingly, you only have to add one. <laughs> You only have to add one. So that, that, that's a, one thing I've argued, or I don't think I've seen it anywhere written down. You could put an RBF here. Once you've added the matern 5 and 2 to it, you basically destroyed the differentiability of that RBF. You don't need to yeah. add it twice. You don't even have to put it in once. Because you can, you know, uh, if you add a function that's only three times differentiable to a function that's infinitely differentiable, your result will be a function that's three times differentiable. So you don't need to worry about adding it in every place, but uh, it probably, uh, if he'd stuck to his own rule, he would have put uh, the term yeah. <laughs> five two over here. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it so important to match the differentiability of the function? Why it is it such a good thing to work with integrals? No, it's not that it's such a good thing. It's just it's bad not to do it because <laughs> if you know something, not put something else as information in your in your model, and if you look at the covariance. One thing that distinguishes them very easily is their differ differentiability. But uh, but yeah, you you can find other other things like uh, yeah other criterion like is it stationary or not? That's also a very important question to ask. Do you think you can if you translate the thing, you do you expect you will end up with the same kind of problem? And if the answer is yes, then you go for a stationary covariance. If the answer is no, then you go for a non-stationary covariance, for example. As general as possible would just mean as short a length scale as possible. Well, it does for an OVF, but not necessarily for In general, but that's what it, so it, it leads to belief in systems of more complex functions. So in some sense, um, the example that the Nicola has here is this, this in some sense is a more general covariance function. Uh, probably if you look at the determinant of this covariance here, then the structured one here. Even though it's only got one term, I think that that's probably the case. So I, I, it's, you have to be careful about how you define more general. It can certainly cover a larger number of data sets than this one can. <laughs> this one's quite specific about the data sets it can cover. So it's, I don't know, it's some of the concepts of what overfitting is and all these things don't really make much sense in Gaussian processes because they're contingent on a model that's defined conditionally independent on the data. And that's not what, how these models are defined. So it's sort of like, I'm not sure I understood your sort of, when you say more general, what you mean. It covers more different. You want to make sure your function stays inside the space of your model. Yeah, well, if you're starting sort of covering as large a space as functions as possible, that seems to me to be a very bad idea because you're not actually including information in your modeling, potentially. Mm. You know, you should only be uh, sufficiently general about the space of functions you want to cover as you believe. So yeah, cover a large space of functions if you don't know what's going on. But if you know what's going on, you should be eliminating functions that you believe aren't existing in your space. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Uh, what we're doing with uh, the outputs, because we are doing this uh, time series, right? Uh, X and Y are the, uh, those outputs. So I have only one output in, in the talk here, but sometimes I'm, I have two dimensions for the input space. Is that your, is your question about that? About the number of output or about the number of dimension of the input? X and Y. Is X the input and Y is the output? Uh, I, I'm not sure I get your... Uh, oh, your in that notation, the kernel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in my notation, this would have been X, X prime. So Nicolas is in a slightly different direction. I started with yours and then I changed it. <laughs> <laughs> so you should have noticed the discontinuity. <laughs> <laughs>
Javier, is there a particular designated public house? <laughs> Devonshire Cat, that's sensible. So yeah, I don't know how many people know the history of public houses, but historically, a public house is just that. It's a place for gathering. They used to carry out public inquiries in public houses. You know, It was where you, the judge would go and find out what happened in the accident. So on that basis, it's an absolutely uh, sensible place to go uh, to do a more discussion of Gaussian process model. Um, so uh, there's, there's food available there. So uh, if, if people sort of say, there's, and there's a wide range of beers. So um, if people want to head down there at whatever time, is there a particular time that people, you'd expect people to be down there? I don't know. Half an hour, just wander down there. It's not far away, it's over Devonshire Green, and then more conversation can occur over beers about how the way Gaussian processes operate. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Nicola. Thank you. Actually, got you to do the.